Welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on to our YouTube channel for our latest installment of our video blog series regarding the Paycheck Protection Program loans. Uh, as, as we presented to you a number of times before, there have been some updates since the last time that we got together. Uh, most notably, uh, some, inf some, some more information on forgiveness. That's what we're going to be going through today. Uh, again, thank you for taking the time to, to watch this video. Uh, my name is Dan Massey. I'm a partner in the Assurance Group at Walls Group, uh, and Ben is a manager in the Assurance Division, and we'll be kind of going back and forth today just to present to you the latest information on PPP loans. Let's just save a sense of what we're going to be going over today. Uh, there was, we had the PPP, uh, it was part of the CARES Act, of course. Most recently, there's been a PPP Flexibility Act uh, that was signed. We're going to go through the major changes uh, that have come about through that. Uh, then there's also been some interim final rulings that have changed some things uh, and given some clarification. We'll touch upon those. There's also uh, one of the things we're going to learn about is how we go. Uh, you can spend now 24 weeks. You can take 24 weeks to spend your PPP funds. We'll talk about the ramifications of that. There's some additional guidance for those who are self-employed. Uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about what we're hearing uh, and what's being reported about some thoughts uh, on, on Capitol Hill. And then if you've got any questions, we'll, we've got a slide about how to, how to reach us. So not to spend too much time rehashing this, by now you probably know most of the history. Uh, CARES Act it was in late March, uh, had a forgiveness application in mid-May. We had webinars after both of those, uh, and those videos are also on our YouTube channel if you'd like to go back to those at, at all. Uh, then there was an updated loan application, uh, that's, and that's a loan application for anyone who, is, who hadn't yet applied for PPP. And if that's you, you have until June 30th. If you're viewing this after June 30th, then the deadline has passed. Uh, a, an updated forgiveness application and a short form application called an EZ were both made available on the 16th of June. You'll see hyperlinks there. Obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, the hyperlinks will not work. But if you ask us for uh, the slides, we will be glad to, to give them to you. And there, those links should work. You can also just go to the treasury.gov uh, website and be able to, should be able to navigate there. Okay, as I said, the last day to submit a PPP loan application is June 30th, so uh, we're, we're recording this on the 25th. So uh, depending on when you're watching this, time is limited, uh, but there are still a number of funds available. Uh, there's been some important changes that were outlined in the joint statement from the uh, Small Business Administration along with the Treasury, and the big uh, things that that covered then were you know, put into uh, law through the Flexibility Act is that, like I said, we're going from eight weeks to 24 weeks to spend, which gives, uh, certainly increases the opportunity that people have for 100% forgiveness. And there was some concern over the 75-25 rule, payroll versus non-payroll. That has been eased to get to a 60-40 split. So as long as 60% of your proceeds are going towards uh, a payroll cost, that should not uh, inhibit your ability to get forgiven. There's a number of different safe harbors uh, that are also put into place there. Uh, the, the biggest change of which is uh, if you've not been able to, to resume full operations because of COVID-related issues dictated by the CDC or OSHA or by states who are following CDC recommendations, uh, then there is a good faith certification that you can get uh, 100% of what you spend forgiven. So that's that's a key change, uh, and you know it is is somewhat subjective, but uh, that is that that is a new uh, part of of the legislation and the interim final rulings. A couple other things: if if you've gotten a loan after June fifth, you've got five years to. Uh, instead of the two years to repay it for any unforgiven portion, and since. Uh, the extension of time from eight weeks to 24 weeks essentially adds roughly four months. The deferral now on the loan goes from six months to 10 months. If you haven't applied for forgiveness after 10 months, then you have to start paying uh, interest. So those are, those are some of the high level changes that are part of the payroll flexibility, payroll PPP flexibility act. Uh, 
So now I'm going to turn it over to Ben to go into some more uh, specifics other than just a high level view, and then I'll be back at the end. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Dan. Appreciate you covering some of those um, ground groundwork um, pieces of information. We're going to dive now into a little bit more detail as to what has come out in the application, the forgiveness application, as well as some subsequent guidance that has come out through interim final rulings. Since then, um, still some similar caveats to what we have had in prior, prior videos. Um, for the most part, applications, forgiveness applications have not been submitted to banks yet. So we're still waiting to see how different banks will interpret different pieces of information and what expectations they will have. Um, and there's still the great unknown as to what additional information is still yet to come. Um, there's, there's been a lot of information that has come out since the Flexibility Act was passed on June 5. A lot of it has been fairly redundant, thankfully. We're gonna cover what um, are, are the biggest changes, um, but we don't know what is yet to come and we'll, we'll fill you in on those as we have them. So digging into the app specifically, not a ton of changes. Most of the changes surround what Dan alluded to, the change from eight weeks to a possible 24 weeks, and also the change from the 75-25 rule to the 60-40 rule. Um, that is, those are the biggest pieces. The instructions are in a separate document now, um, but the same, the page one, 11 line calculation, it, it didn't change. It's still essentially the same form. Um, there is a new certification relating to owner's compensation. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into that as we go. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time there now, but wanted to acknowledge there is a new certification relating to owner compensation. Um, for any that are asking, hey, what's my cap on employees? That is essentially just the 15,000 that it was previously multiplied by three, getting to 46,154. If you're electing the 24 weeks, that is your cap. Um, and there was a, a slight change relating to non-cash compensation. Um, the application now says paid or incurred as opposed to just paid. We believe that doesn't really change how you're going to approach. We think that when they're talking about paid or incurred, they're, they're not necessarily referring to amounts you would have incurred prior to your covered period and paid during your covered period. We think that's just reflecting the flexibility that was given previously that you can pay it subsequent to your covered period if that's when it was regularly scheduled to be paid um, within your pay periods. Um, so that's, that's what we're looking at there. But those really are the biggest changes on the application. Um, some, some substantive notes as it relates to the Flexibility Act being manifested in the application. Um, and these relate to 100% safe harbor. So as Dan alluded to, there are now three. The first one, and there is still very limited guidance on this. This came out with the first forgiveness application and it is still there. And it is that there is no reduction in your number of employees or the average paid hours of employees between January 1st of 2020 and the end of your cover period. Essentially, um, if you didn't have a reduction in employees or hours, then you don't have an FTE reduction, you're at 100%. Practically speaking, it seems like that's how it would calculate. There is some questions that said, hey, if you started at this level and you dipped to this level and you came up to this level, if that's flat at the end, as it was at the beginning, does that make you eligible for this FTE or did you have to be at the same level the whole time? There is this line, this bullet point, there's a line on the application for it and there is no guidance towards it whatsoever at this stage. Um, so that is still a question we don't know. I think conservatively, you could read it to say that they're intending that you were just flat the whole time, but aggressively you could definitely um, interpret it to allow for a valley in the middle as long as you got back up to the other side. The second FTE safe harbor, and this Dan alluded to, this is a brand new one. And it says that if you were unable to operate between February 15 and the end of the covered period at the same level as before, due to compliance with requirements established or issued between Jan I mean, March 1st and December 31st by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, the director of the CDC or OSHA, um, essentially you can have a safe harbor that says you're not gonna be penalized for reducing 
your FTEs as a result of those requirements. And when this first came out, there was the question of, you know, how do you interpret that in light of state regulations that have been put in place? There was nothing in the Flexibility Act relating to state regulations, but an IFR has come out that pulls state and local government ordinances or shutdowns into that FTE. So it talks about having documentation to support the position. So I think if we're going to elect this safe harbor, we need to be very careful. But this is a very big safe harbor for many of you. If you think about it, if you have a $200,000 spend and maybe your FTE percentage was 40% because you've been shut down, prior to this, your forgiveness would have been 40% of 200,000, which is $80,000 obviously not what you would have liked, assuming you have a, you know, over an eight week period or your app, you know, maybe your application was say 250,000, 80,000 forgiveness on 250,000 over eight weeks is less than desirable. But with this, if you can say, hey, I'm not gonna get penalized for my FTEs and I get 100% of my $200,000 spend, that's a $120,000 swing just in that instance. So I, I believe, we believe this is something that many of you are gonna to wanna to look at, but we're also gonna to wanna to make sure that we document well and are able to firmly establish your position that, that your reduction in employees can be correlated to um, requirements established or guidance issued by, by those three regulatory um, agencies, even if it is indirectly from them through state government. So that's a big one. The next one, the third one, really isn't a new one either. It's similar to the first one. It's been there before, but it is slightly it is slightly modified. If you remember, previously we had the FTE safe harbor, where if you brought your workforce back by June 30th, that you you could meet a safe harbor, and really all that has changed. That is still there. It's just that if you are a user of the 24 weeks you would use 1231.20, or if your forgiveness application date is earlier, you would use that date. So the June 30 cutoff has essentially been eliminated and it's been replaced with the loan forgiveness application date or December 31, 2020, whichever comes earlier. Um, so if you were sitting there and saying, hey, you know what, I still don't meet either of those 100% FTE safe harbors. There still are a lot of fillers in place where if you had FTE reductions due to rehire refusals, terminations for cause, voluntary resignations, um, voluntary requests for hour reductions, where you have an employer employee saying, hey, I'd like to reduce my hours. Um, if, you are un, if you have had to eliminate um, FTEs and you aren't able to rehire those exact individuals, there's an exception for you, or if you are unable to hire a qualified replacement individual, there's some, some fillers for those. So if you have those instances and you want to discuss them with us, we can explain how those kind of fit into the application and how you would calculate those. But those are available to you if you don't meet either of the 100% FTE safe harbors. So owner compensation, this is, this is something that took a slightly different direction than what we were expecting to see um, and slightly different than precedents that had been set for the eight weeks. What they're doing for the 24 weeks makes, conceptual, makes sense conceptually. Um, you can see what they're doing, um, may not necessarily agree with it, but it's the position they're taking and essentially what they're doing for 24 weeks is they're saying we don't want to forgive loan amounts for owner compensation of an amount that is greater than they received a loan for. So practically speaking, your owner compensation um, was based off of two and a half months of spend in 2019, and they don't want for forgiveness to be given at an amount greater than that. So here's a little table that spells it out a little bit. Um, I don't wanna go through each cell individually. Practically speaking for eight weeks in broad terms, you're looking at the lesser of 850 seconds of your 2019 net earnings or 15385, whichever is less. Um, and based off of different entity types, what that baseline is and what you're using 
is going to be different, but that's the concept for all of them. Um, and then the 24 weeks, like I said, they limit it to 2.5 out of 12 um, or 20,833. So let's say your comp, your comp in 2019 was $200,000 for an owner. Um, you're just gonna be, and let's say you pay them a similar amount here in 2020, that's gonna get reduced to a prorated $100,000 and that's gonna be 20,833. Um, if you're a Schedule C or a Schedule F, that's gonna be based off of your 2019 net profit. And Dan will, Dan will touch base on how this works out for Schedule C and F filers here in a little bit. Um, but practically speaking, if you were over 100,000 in 2019 and your pay rate has been over $100,000 for an owner here in 2020, you're likely going to get 15385 or 2833 depending on depending on what covered period you are selecting. And want to allude here if you have an owner that is in multiple businesses and has PPP for multiple businesses, these limited these amounts are limited across all businesses. So you can't get 20,833 for each business or 15,385 for each business. Collectively, they are limited to those amounts. Um, the other thing that has come out with the new application and subsequent guidance relates to the retirement benefits and health benefits of these owners. There was a question previously that has been there before in terms of, well, is these limitations for owners it are retirement benefits and health insurance benefits included in those limits. And there was reasonable ground to stand on previously to say no, that it was 15385 plus retirement plus health. Um, then it started to, um, through guidance, get a little bit more restricted where you started thinking, okay, maybe for some entities, it's not and, and it's that the retirement and health is included in the 15385. And at this stage, they have really spelled that out for us and made it fairly clear. Um, essentially, they're taking the position, if you're a general partner, that your retirement benefits and your health insurance are, are included in the cash compensation amount, so you can't pick them up in addition to those. If you're an S-Corp, you're allowed to pick up your retirement benefits, but they're taking the position that your health insurance is included in those amounts, so you can't pick it up. Um, if you're a Schedule E, C, or a Schedule F, you can't pick up the retirement or health in addition to your comp. And if you're a Schedule C, you're allowed to pick up both of them because they're saying that's not included in your cash comp. Um, so depending which entity type you are, you're gonna get to a different answer on those. If you have questions about those, let us know. Um, hopefully this table gives you some, some feeling for what you're working with. Um, but ask us if you have questions on it because this is going to relate to everybody in some way, shape, or form. Just as a clarification there, Ben, you said Schedule C when you meant C-Corp. So C-Corp, you're allowed to include the retirement and health. Uh, Schedule C, uh, you, you can't. So just, just to clarify that for anyone listening. Good. Thank you for the clarification, Dan. Um, next piece. This is, this is something that just came out here. Um, days are running together. It was either end of last week or the beginning of this week. So the application implied that you could use eight weeks or 24 weeks. The Flexibility Act implied that you could use eight weeks or 24 weeks and that those were the only options. However, thankfully, an IFR has come out that you may submit a loan forgiveness application at any time on or before the maturity of the loan, including before the end of the covered period. Um, so many of you who are looking at this 24 week period, we've gotten this question many, many times in terms of, do I have to use 24 weeks? Do I have to wait the whole time before I can submit for forgiveness? Um, because I think many of you are ready for this to be done with. You're ready, you're ready to get your loan forgiveness application filed and say, okay, good, we're done. Um, and up until the IFR came out, a few days ago, there was there was nothing to there was nothing to substantiate doing something other than filing after 24 weeks. But with that IFR coming out, you now have that flexibility. Um, we have here what about FTE count for shorter than 24 weeks? There's still not really guidance in terms of how you would calculate um, your safe harbor um, base periods or your FTE calcs if you don't go the full 24 weeks. Um, 
in my mind, it's going to be either one of two things. It's going to be based off of when you file your application or when you define your spend having ended. Um, there isn't guidance on that, so we'll need to cross those bridge once we, once we get there. But theoretically speaking, many of you, once you get to week 10, 11, 12, 13, are going to be at full forgiveness and are going to be ready to, for, to submit your applications. Um, and we're going to be ready to do whatever we can to help you um, work through those at that time. Um, but at this stage, there's not really guidance in terms of how we would do some of those things. But it seems reasonable to think that something would be coming because this is just a brand new, a brand new concept. Um, if you're thinking about, hey, how do I choose between eight weeks or 24 weeks? Everything seems to reflect the point that 24 weeks or a shorter based off of spend if you apply order is what they're assuming you will use. If you use eight weeks, it's almost like you have to elect to use eight weeks, um, but there's no guidance on how to elect. So absent guidance, we're thinking that you would just apply and your eight week would be reflected based off of the covered period that you input on your application. We do recommend letting your bank know if you're going to be using the eight week or a longer period, just so they know what you're, what you're thinking. If you're planning to use the eight week period, many of those loan documents have limitations on how long after that loan, that covered period ends that you're supposed to submit the application. Um, so you don't wanna to get too far past that, planning to use eight weeks and have your bank say, wait a second, you needed to submit this 10 days ago and you'd be past it. So, so we recommend at the end of your eight week window, just touching base with your bank, regardless of what you're going to do, to let them know what you're planning so they know what to expect. And if they have some specific instructions for you, um, they can give that to you. The next thing to cover, this is just to try to give you an idea of some, some considerations. And you know, these aren't fact, but just some concepts around, should I do eight weeks or should I do 24 weeks? Um, so we have kind of five columns here that outline some theoretical um, possibilities with the first column being just, you know, you got to the end of your eight weeks, you had a $100,000 loan, you spent $80,000, you had an FTE reduction of 80%. So your, your forgiveness at the end of eight weeks would have been $64,000 and you'd be leaving $36,000 on the table at that stage. So let's say that's our baseline and you're looking at it and saying, should I go to 24 weeks? And what are my risks of going to 24 weeks? So let's say, you know, the, this column B, the second column, 24 weeks, just keeping your same level of activity, that's pretty straightforward that that's gonna be a win for you. I mean, at that stage, your spend is at 240,000, so 80% of that is 192. So you're well over your $100,000 of loan and you get your 100,000 forgiveness. But let's say you say, hey, you know what? I've kept everybody on pay for these last eight weeks because I had PPP to do it. And now that my PPP has run out, I need to start reducing some of my staff. What if I go from eight to six? And so you have eight weeks at eight FTEs, and then you're gonna have 16 weeks at six FTEs. How does that work out for me? And what you can see here is that at that stage, even at the end of 24 weeks, you're still at full forgiveness. So let's say if instead of going from eight to six, you go from eight to five. Um, and at that stage, your average FTEs for the covered period is six. Even at that, you're still at $108,000 of potential forgiveness, which is over the 100,000. So if you think about it, um, at six out of eight or at that 60%, you're right around that 60% barrier and you're still, you're still fully covered. Now, once you drop to four, that is where it starts to it starts to potentially swinging the other way. Um, if, if you're cutting your FTEs in half over the next 16 weeks, at that stage, you have the potential to not get full forgiveness. Although keeping in mind your 84,800 for that one is still greater than the 64,000 you would have gotten at eight weeks. So even cutting your FTEs in half and having a spend that reflects that up there in the payroll costs um, you're still probably going to be in a more favorable position, even if you cut your FTEs in half for the next 16 weeks. Now, once you go below half, you start getting pretty, you start getting pretty close. Um, and that's where you'll want to be careful. But all this to say for most of you, 
there, there is risk in going to 24 weeks. If you're concerned about it, we should talk about it. If you're considering significantly reducing your FTEs over the next 16 weeks, we should talk about it. Um, but for most of you, you'll be able to withstand a drop in FTEs and still be in a greater position than you were at eight weeks. And this is not keeping in mind any of those safe harbors or FTE fillers that we talked about earlier that could potentially just make this discussion completely go away. And at that stage, your total step three reduction factor is 100%. Um, and, and you're going to get full forgiveness across the whole board. So hopefully that makes some sense as you look at it. That's just a way to try to kind of help you think through those. It's a question I'm sure many of you have had or are going to have, um, and hopefully that is helpful. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Dan to, to take us to the finish line. All right. Thanks, Ben. Just a couple other things on 24-week considerations. And we've, this is a, these are questions we've started to get a lot, especially for uh, fiscal year-end clients. If you're a December 31st uh, taxpayer financial statement, most of this will probably be resolved by, by that point in terms of getting forgiveness or at least having your application in. But for those of you who are June or September year-ends or, or common year-ends, uh, something you have to give some consideration to is uh, the impact of loan forgiveness on financial statement reporting processes purposes. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of the, the different uh, it, it, options that you could take on here regarding gain contingencies and uh, it, it, treating a for-profit like some of the nonprofit rules or some international rules. But there are a number of uh, ways you can look at this if you're a fiscal year-end client. Please talk to us about your specific situation, but it, it's not necessarily cut and dried unless you've used all of your funds before the, the end of uh, your fiscal year, then, then it's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, same thing for tax uh, returns if you're a fiscal year uh, client. So uh, it, we'll, we'll get to this in the Washington rumblings section, but as for right now, the expenses that you incur are not deductible. So if you're a June 30th taxpayer uh, and you've incurred some expenses for forgiveness and you're not forgiven until later on, make sure that, uh, that you're talking with us about how that tax planning is going to come into, into play. Uh, because it's not necessarily a, a, a simple answer and requires a little bit of planning. Self-employed guidance, as has been indicated, we'd circle back to this. Uh, the, the, uh, the interesting thing about this is basically if you're a, if you're a Schedule C, the way that they drew this up, uh, your loan application was based on two and a half months out of, uh, two and a half out of 12 months. So now it's based on your 2019 earnings. So now, uh, if you if you choose the 24 week period, or theoretically maybe anything even after 10 weeks, uh, you're going to get two and a half twelfths of 2019 uh, profit as your forgiveness. So basically, if you're self-employed, you're pretty much guaranteed 100% forgiveness through this process, uh, regardless of of any non-payroll costs, utilities, interest. Uh, uh, rent, anything like that. So Schedule C filers, good news. Uh, you're going to essentially get 100% forgiveness. And uh, the one thing you'd, you'd have to just talk to your bank about is how quickly you can apply because anything that's less than two and a half twelfths of the year or anything that's more than two and a half twelfths of the year would essentially get you to the same point. You probably don't have to wait 24 weeks, although theoretically the you already have the money and when it's forgiven do doesn't make a huge uh, difference because it's all going to be during 2020 anyway, and, and nearly every Schedule C is a December year-end filer. Uh, so a couple of things that we're seeing uh, from Washington based on what's been reported and, and you know, some, uh, when various folks have, have testified in front of uh, Congress, there, it's possible there's going to be a second round of PPP. does not seem like they're in a big rush to do that yet. Obviously, there's a number of moving parts there. Uh, the whole first round and the, the addendum to it have not been spent. Uh, we don't know exactly where things are going to go with the coronavirus. Obviously, numbers, as we talk now, are, are increasing. Does that mean that there's going to be, uh, you know, people are going to have to, you know, pull back in a little bit with, with how much they're doing, what effect would that have on businesses? Uh, so there's a number of moving parts that, that are happening here. It seems like uh, 
and the Treasury is not in a rush to to do this, uh, and uh, of course Congress has to has to do that as well. So, uh, supposedly there is some bipartisan support in the Senate for making the expenses that lead to forgiveness deductible, which would be which would overrule the IRS's interpretation and make this entire forgiven portion tax-free, essentially. So the Senate has not done anything with that yet, but uh, you know, for if you're a June 30th uh, taxpayer and you're using the eight-week period and you and you're expecting full forgiveness, it's probably something you that you're hoping that there's an answer to relatively soon. So uh, that would have to pass, uh, you know, both chambers of of Congress and be signed by the president as well. But the the Senate believes they've got unanimous consent for it. But you know that can always that can always change depending on what their priorities are. Uh, we've also had some questions about uh, people have heard rumors about uh, you know the IRS deadline from. April 15th was changed to be July 15th. There's questions about, is that still going to be the case? Uh, I, I think you're, you're best off assuming that July 15th is going to be the final due date, but Secretary Mnuchin did not completely shut the door onto that changing uh, during one of his uh, recent uh, comments. So, so it is possible, but do not hang your hat on that. I would expect if you if you have an amount due on July 15th, I would be prepared to to pay that, even if you have to extend your return and not file it to October 15th. If you've got a payment due, pay it on July 15th. Uh, even though the IRS is is a little slow right now and they're not necessarily cashing those checks immediately, uh, you still want to get that in unless you hear something explicitly different than that. Uh, some other things that came out. And this is interesting. Uh, this is just last week. Initially, there had been uh, concern that anyone who applied, this is going to be public record. And then there was commentary that, well, no, we have no intention of making this public. Now it seems like they've reversed course again and that there is some information that could be made uh, public. You can see their business name, address, uh, type of business that they're in, uh, zip code, uh, so just some general demographic data. Won't specifically say how much the loan was for, but we'll give a range of what the loan uh, is for. So uh, just so you know, I don't know where necessarily that would be uh, published or where that can be, uh, you know, seen or, or determined, but if you have a PPP loan, it is possible that that, that information could become public. Uh, probably it'd also be subject to Freedom Information Act requests as well. So just so you know, that's not a surprise if someone, uh, you know, that's not related to you finds out or you or your business finds out how much your, generally what your PPP loan was for. Uh, how to reach us. Uh, we've certainly been fielding comments and, and questions from a number of people, clients and non-clients. So if you're viewing this, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to either uh, myself or Ben. You can see our phone number there. There's our email addresses as well. And uh, if you're viewing this, you may have already gotten the slides in an email uh, along with the link to the, to the YouTube clip. If you have just come across this or if you're a subscriber to our YouTube channel and you have not gotten the slides to this presentation, certainly feel free to send us an email. We'll be glad to provide them to you. Uh, we know, as Ben said, that this has become a long and tedious process and there certainly is uh, a, a good measure of PPP fatigue. So we certainly feel for you there, but as you continue to have questions or if you're getting ready to apply and need some assistance through that uh, that process, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our, our, we've got, uh, beyond myself and Ben, we've got a, a number of team members that are well-versed in this that can help with uh, anything, including forgiveness applications. So we hope to hear from you. We hope that you're continuing to do well during uh, this unusual circumstance. And uh, again, don't hesitate to reach out as, as you have need of us. Thank you.